The last uh, few years I've been focusing especially on Howard's poetry since he's, uh, it's, it's one, of the, one of the several areas that have been neglected. Uh, I think a lot of people come to Howard just knowing Conan only, the one character, uh, but Howard's a long way from being a one-trick pony. And uh, he's, he's a very complex writer. And uh, regarding the poetry, uh, a lot of people didn't, weren't even aware, and, and some still aren't aware, that he's even a poet at all. Uh, but the man wrote, uh, well, we, we've lost, sadly lost some, at least we have titles and no, no, no copy of a poem extant that we know of. But there are over 700 poems and fragments that we have. And uh, the task of the last couple of years, uh, I'm not alone in that, putting things together, but a few of us have been working on gradually getting variants and sort of the, the closest to Howard's pure text and that sort of thing. Uh, if we can, actual typescripts or photostats of typescripts. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the poetry is, uh, as with any work, as with his prose too, it's, it's not all gold, but there's a lot of gold in there. Uh, I think he was uh, definitely a, a great poet, and uh, it, it, to that regard, uh, uh, matter of fact, one of, the, one of the things he regretted in his life was that poetry had no real market. Uh, the times he, he got uh, maybe one or two poems published here or there. Uh, certainly it wasn't going to pay the rent like his, his fiction was going. Uh, but I think he was a poet at heart, uh, every bit as much as he was a fiction writer. Uh, Tevis Smith uh, says in uh, sort of a, a note in one preface that he was at heart a poet more than a, a prose writer. Uh, I, th I see him as the last, probably the last narrative poet in, in America and maybe in the English language. Uh, uh, the, the story poem is pretty much a dead art these days, and, and he, may, uh, he may be the last, uh, he's, certainly, he's certainly among the last of the poets uh, writing the story poem, and it was really his forte, uh, the, the ballad, uh, uh, but he dabbles in lots of things. He, he tried a little bit of free verse and prose poetry. Uh, his, his lyrical stuff and his, uh, his rhymed verse is his best stuff, I think. Uh, he was a master of the sonnet, which is uh, a rather difficult for him, and uh, wrote over 40 of them. So uh, it's, uh, you know, he's, he's a fellow who has uh, uh, lots of things going on. Not only does he write in different forms, uh, the sonnet, the ballad, the villanelle, some free verse, some blank verse, he, he, he pretty much, uh, you can tell, although he kind of, uh, as is typical in his letters, he, he sort of plays the false modesty thing, and you know, I'm, I don't really, I don't really study poetry much. I've never formally trained or anything like that. You can tell that he's read enough theory as well as enough poetry to, to know pretty much what he's up to. Uh, the, the, the letters and the poems, I think, show us the real Howard. More, there's that mask in his fiction that's always there. I think that, that's, that's dropped a little bit, with the, certainly in the letters and also I think especially in the poems. I, I thought I saw at least 30, and I numbered them as 30, uh, different themes and topics, uh, different ways of, of doing poetry. For instance, uh, well, the, uh, he writes, uh, some of them are topical. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote poems about boxing, <laughs> just like his boxing stories. He's got a whole section on, that I, I divided one section off as poems about pirates. Uh, there's a lot of piracy stuff there. There are, of course, the poems that everybody's familiar with, uh, the darker, gloomier ones. The, a couple that, that do mention, for instance, suicide or uh, his, his dark barbarian angle on, on life, that sort of cynical worldview that, that civilization is a veneer <clears throat> that will always finally fade away. Uh, so, so, so that does come through in some of his stuff, but, but there's also uh, some lyrical stuff, some sonnets that would have to be called love poems. Uh, uh, the, I think there's a, just as Shakespeare has sort of the, as she's usually referred to, the dark, the dark woman of the sonnets, I, I think there's some, some hints in, in, in Howard that, uh, uh, you know, we know of Novel and Price and, and their, you know, uh, romance and their, their friendship. But there are probably some uh, some ladies in Howard's life, uh, one way or the other, that that are, are hinted at there, and not and not only his mother, as many critics, maybe too many critics, have have dwelt upon. Um, but the uh, those are some some topical ones. But I, I see some that uh, are longer narratives. Uh, I think he wanted to do the long 
almost epic, not maybe not epic length, but uh, um, kind of like the Ballad of the White Horse. The ball kind of very much influenced. He, as a matter of fact, he was interested by uh, interested in and influenced by Chesterton, and uh, the Ballad of the White Horse. Uh, uh, certainly, he writes even a few poems about it. And another category of poems. Uh, one section I have is uh, is uh, poems about poetry and poets and, and inspiration in general. Uh, some that are, are lighter hearted. Uh, he has a few that actually uh, come straight from scripture or are based upon biblical stories. Now we're, talk we're not talking many out of 700, but there are a handful or so that show that he was familiar with uh, you know, biblical story as well as other stuff, ancient myth. Uh, he, uh, he, he writes poems, uh, descriptive poems about places, uh, Stonehenge, Easter Island, uh, places that I know in his mind he yearned to, and, you know, traveled there in his mind, but uh, he, he was a, a fellow who uh, did some traveling, but mostly here in Texas in the southwest, really never leaving the region physically, but uh, he was able to travel through books and, uh, and through his own writing, too. There certainly is, uh, one of them is, is uh, one big section is, is the first one just about uh, adventuring and, and sort of a wanderlust. Uh, again, while he physically was able to do that traveling, uh, and especially a love of the sea comes through too also, even though you know, he's removed from the sea here, I think it, you know, he bumped into it down at Galveston or New Orleans when he went on a couple trips, but uh, he seems to have been fascinated by sailing, voyaging, just journeying and having adventures. And of course that comes through in his fiction, you know, he's a great adventure writer. But a lot of the poems are about that sort of wanderlust and, and the, the urge to travel and keep on moving. Uh, there's, a, there's a fairly hefty section of the kind people would expect with, uh, you know, I'm the dark barbarian that towers over all. And, you know, the, the, uh, the idea of that, uh, that sort of life view that's usually what people hit on, uh, the, the poems that they emphasize there. I've got a section of a few that touch on reincarnation, and I'm, I'm not completely sure that Howard didn't kind of believe in it. Uh, uh, at least he dabbles in uh, wherever his actual worldview or, or his uh, any sense of of something beyond uh, would be. That, so that there's a section there. Uh, the story poems, as I mentioned, I kind of divide into topics of you know boxing, uh, uh, piracy. Uh, another theme that's fairly common in him is uh, uh, well, I've got to, there. Of course, there's a, a section on light verse and. <laughs> And some of the more risque stuff that I think he only he meant for Tevis Clyde Smith to read, and maybe nobody else. But here we are, of course, published them later later on. But some of the stuff that's uh, just for fun, you know, and some of them are just light verse uh, parodies of some of his favorite poets, like Robert Service or uh, uh, Kipling. You know, uh, you can tell from what's interesting about the parodies is you can tell. Uh, matter of fact, the series I'm doing in Rehupa now, I just did a fourth installment that I'm going to hammer into an essay sometime. Uh, that I call Bards Before Bob. Uh, in looking at enough of his poetry, you can see that he's consciously kind of taking themes and ideas and even some stylistic tendencies from some of his favorite poets, some of whom aren't even mentioned in the letters. Or, or But I, I can tell, in one case, for instance, I don't think anywhere in, in, in any of the letters is Gerard Manley Hopkins mentioned, but he's got one poem in a section that I call People Poems. <laughs> Actually, most of them happen from one letter to Tevis Clyde Smith. There, there are 20 or so of these little four to eight line vignettes of, of different, uh, by occupation usually, different, different people. Uh, the cowboy, the, the one that's, that's called Nun, just a, a nun, N-U-N, uh, is, is a definite spin-off of, uh, of a poem by, uh, by Hopkins called the, the Nun Takes the Veil. It's, it's, you can tell line by line that it's a direct and of course, Howard puts his own spin on it. That uh, in uh, in Hopkins' poem, she's safe and uh, she's happy for her choice. In in Howard's, uh, she's sort of wandering and yearning to be <laughs> out there, out there and free. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, he has that a little bit of that cynical take in some. But uh, so so those are uh, just a few sections. There's one section on. Uh, of the longer narratives, uh, uh, the the Viking poem. Uh, the Ballad of King Geraint. Uh, in, in three cases, he writes a poem that's uh, significant length, you know, uh, several pages long. Uh, Geraint's probably the longest at about 
well, in, in the text, as it's laid out right now, it would take about 20 pages of text. The levels I see of, of, of interpreting uh, Howard in terms of finding out as much as we can of who Bob Howard was, uh, I, see the, I see the poetry as maybe the thing that, because I think, I think poets, when they, when they uh, you know, they, they have to concentrate feeling, emotion, thought in a, in a, in a small package. That's the whole mission of the form, is to uh, is to say a lot, and and I think they also, uh, well, all of us, whenever we communicate, we give something of ourselves away. You know, people people learn who we are, what we think, by whether we want them to or not through the words we we put down. But anything as as focused and concentrated and thought out as as a crafted poem, um, I, I think Howard ends up. Uh, giving us more of himself directly. You know, he lets his guard down, I think. Uh, in the letters even, and, and I think the letters are maybe the second best way to find out who he was, uh, there's, a, there's a posturing in the letters. Uh, in the, well, it, it fades away in some of them. Uh, in the early Lovecraft letters, for instance, you can pretty well tell that here's this young writer who's just amazed to be corresponding with H.P. Lovecraft. But by the time that, that pen pal friendship correspondence goes on in another couple, three years, He's, he's more open, freer to say exactly what he thinks and to criticize Lovecraft on occasion, uh, to disagree with him, you know, sometimes fairly vehemently about, about different issues. Uh, having said that, as a tale teller, uh, there's also a little bit of fiction in the letters, I think, too. I think that there's a posturing or a persona that Howard puts forward about the, the rough, tough Texan, you know, the this is rugged country and that sort of thing. He, uh, knowing that Lovecraft will probably never leave <laughs> Rhode Island and come down here to visit. Uh, but uh, the, the, the book that maybe, although it's, it's, it's wrong to think of it as an autobiography, uh, Post Oaks and Sand Ruffs, is, is uh, well, I, I wouldn't call it a, a great book. It's certainly not his best as far as the writing of it. But to, to the extent that it's characters that are quite obviously himself and Teva Smith and, and his, uh, his year or so with the experience at, at Howard Payne uh, uh, University uh, down in Brownwood, uh, we can't take it as exact truth and, and that it isn't exactly him or what he did. Some of it's probably fictionalized, but we see some of him there. Uh, the stories, uh, you know, I see, I see him, as, as all writers do, there's sort of a, a persona or a, a mask in a sense that's, you know, there's, the, there's that narrative voice that may or may not exactly be Bob Howard. Uh, the, uh, the, the poems, uh, I think that, also I think that in many cases because he was not having luck publishing them, uh, and, and many of them seem to be, uh, even though we, I think of them as finished and boy, what a, you know, what a good job on that one. On his first, what he claims is his first sonnet, uh, a thing about, uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of the Easter Island poems, I think. Uh, or possibly, I think it's, it might be Stonehenge. <laughs> uh, it's a descriptive sonnet. He's saying, I, I've written a sonnet my first. Well, if it's his first, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty amazing piece of work. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, he tends to, uh, uh, though b because of the failures getting the book of, published, of poetry published that he wanted to, uh, three or four times he and Clyde Smith and a few other people were trying to get a book out there. Uh, he finally, and, and fairly early, uh, uh, not get, doesn't really give up, but he, he doesn't write much poetry after his early 20s. Uh, of course, he only lives to be 30, but, but the, the later years of his life seem to have been devoted almost exclusively to the fiction that was paying the rent. So we also have most of his stuff is, is the stuff from a, a guy in his late teens, early 20s, which is all the more remarkable. Uh, as I, I may have mentioned earlier, I see him as, the, as maybe the last great narrative poet in the English language. 